Well, thank you so much for joining me, Natesh. Uh, really excited to have you here um, on this holiday uh, early in the year. And so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to chat and really all the things that you're building. I initially learned about Dflow um, at the breakpoint uh, this past year and attended your MEV chat uh, with a couple others and was really inspired about what you're building. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, feels like Breakpoint was years ago at this point. I know. Uh, every, every Breakpoint. I went to the first Breakpoint in 2021, and that was kind of the mark of the Pico top. And then shortly after this Breakpoint was the FTS saga. So hopefully this one marks the bottom. But um, it does yeah. feel like oh, a lifetime Fingers ago. crossed. <laughs> Yeah. But um, I would love to, before we dive into Dflow, what you're building there, I would love to get a little bit more background and color on yourself, uh, how you got into tech, and then kind of more broadly, like what got you interested in crypto? Yeah, um, was always pretty interested in computer science and tech. Uh, did CS at the University of Illinois um, and you know, was always peripherally interested in crypto there, but never really dived into the guts of it. Um, spent a lot of time with like compilers research and things like that there. So uh, was always paying attention to the EVM and this idea of like a computer that was, you know, shared across nodes globally. Um, so that, that I found really awesome and was just always playing around with it, um, but really kind of got into the depths of um, like crypto in, I think early 2021, so like December 2020, January 2021 was when I started actually writing code. Um, and interestingly enough, I, I was at that point a quantitative researcher at TRW, so um, was really interested in kind of like the DeFi slash markets applications and uh, Project Serum of all things was what kind of got me interested just because it was an order book on chain and, you know, order books were what I was doing my day-to-day -day on. So it was really interesting to see. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So did how far did you get down like the um, rabbit hole with the EVM? Um, I, I kind of like looked at the op codes and how it was structured um, and, you know, tried to go through some of the white paper stuff, but a lot of it was extremely, extremely academic and, you yeah. uh, kind of boring, to be frank. Um, I, I think the more applied stuff is definitely more interesting for me. And so um, when I messed around with Solidity and started writing Solidity code was kind of when I, I think, really went into it full time. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's super interesting. The I, I, I really enjoyed kind of Ethereum and all the things that the key innovations of like the smart contracts that it unlocked, but then really got into like scaling and different virtual machines and how they work. And I was also amazed by Serum and being able to build like a whole order book on chain. Uh, could you talk about just a little bit more of your time and some of the things that you were learned as a quantitative researcher and kind of how that led you to be like more interested in order books instead of like an AMM? Yeah. Um, so I, I was on one of the low latency trading desks and uh, I think naturally you just end up doing a lot of stuff really close to both programming and research when, when you're talking about trading at, at that latency level. Um, and so a lot of my day to day, -to -day uh, was not only doing research and trying to uh, come up with trading strategies from ground up, but helping other quantitative researchers with theirs, but then also going and implementing this and sort of really, you know, low level C++ close to the metal things. Um, and yeah, I think what, what got me interested in Serum was this idea that there's, you know, pretty decent volume that's being traded through this decentralized order book. And, um, I think in particular, I, I was most interested in the fact that like, you know, given this is on chain, it's, it's a whole new style of trading and it's one that a lot of people aren't really that experienced in. Um, and so I felt like there was, you know, opportunity there, um, and that kind of, opened the gates to understanding that there was just opportunity everywhere in crypto in terms of this is new infrastructure. It's going to, it's going to stick around for a while and it's going to make things a lot different in five to 10 years. So best to get acquainted with it now. Definitely. I, I always, 
I always think it's interesting how, what, what was it, I guess, that ultimately wanted you or convinced you to make the jump? Because I think when I talk with a lot of people, uh, once you have kind of gotten some level of success or that early idea is validated, everybody's like, yes, of course you would obviously have like left your job and have done this. And, but at when, at that point in time, when you decide to do it, it's very not obvious and often very scary. So could you talk about the things that really convinced you that like crypto was this next iteration and next wave? Yeah. Um, I think fundamentally the technology was really interesting. And, you know, I, I had heard of Bitcoin before, but um, when you write your first solidity contract and deploy it, like that's kind of when you realize that there's, there's a whole like unexplored paradigm of computation in front of you. Um, I think that was, that was the moment I started sliding into it. I think concretely uh, the, the moment when I decided to make the jump was, um, when I uh, started working on Dflow, uh, it was it was basically based on the premise that you know traders, retail traders in in DeFi, are um, getting horribly inefficient execution. Like it's just kind of ridiculous compared to equities markets. What you and I have to pay in in fees, and then what we get on top of that in execution quality when we trade um, tokens and. And you still see it like it's it's shocking how how long it's gone on. If you go and look at what you're paying in, in fees when you swap on on a wallet that's routed to to Uniswap, you're uh, you're just you know you're getting you're getting ripped through. So um, it's it's tough. And I think that was that was the moment concretely when I decided to make the jump because I just realized this is this is uh, something that won't last. You know, and someone's going to build this infrastructure, and I, I would love for that person to be me um, because it's a really interesting problem service. Definitely. So maybe jumping into Dflow, can you describe <laughs> uh, what Dflow is and kind of your North Star or vision for creating it? Yeah, so Dflow is a marketplace for order flow. Um, it allows parties that have retail order flow to go and auction them off in a decentralized permissionless auction to market makers. Um, and it's, it's really a model of payment for order flow. Although, um, you know, payment for order flow in crypto has a lot of different analogous names. You know, people call it MEV extraction and redistribution. It, it's all sort of payment for order flow uh, and payment for order flow in equities markets is MEV redistribution. Um, but yeah, it's it's a permissionless model for order flow auctioning and purchasing by uh, retail brokerages like you know the the common wallets and then um, market makers like your sort of common quant market making firms um, can can dive into a little bit about how it's uh, different from uh, tradfi PFOF, um, but there's just tons to double click on here. So you yeah, know. I I think that would be a great place to start because in the tradfi world. I think when you say payment for order flow, the biggest thing that people think of today, at least on the retail side, is kind of Robin Hood and some of like the semi negative connotations around that. So I would love to have you kind of explain the differences between um, the TradFi and what you're trying to accomplish on like the decentralized front with payment for order flow with Dflow. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think the first thing is we're, we're not trying to bring the Robinhood Citadel dynamic into crypto. Uh, I, you know, I think for a lot of us, we sort of believe in, in crypto being a different type of financial system, and, and we don't we don't want Robinhood Citadel v two, but this time in crypto. Um, and so, I, I guess with that, it, it probably makes sense to dive into a little bit of why payment for order flow has a negative connotation in uh, traditional markets and equities markets, and then um, how we're trying to basically take take the good parts of payment for order flow in TradFi and, and bring it to DeFi. And so um, in, in TradFi PFOF, you, you, know, you have market-making firms like Citadel Securities and brokerages like Robinhood. And um, you know, these, these brokerages will sell their users order flow at sort of predetermined prices and uh, based on agreements with sort of various axes and 
configurable parameters to um, to the market makers. And uh, this this mechanism is called payment for order flow. Market makers are obligated to execute that retail volume at at best prices, uh, as measured by the national best bid and offer system, and um, and that's that's the entire mechanism. You know, Robinhood sells order flow to Citadel. Citadel executes it at at the NBBO or better. Um, the The problem with this mechanism is, is the main problem I would say is the lack of transparency. I think for uh, users of Robinhood, they have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. I think. You know, Citadel isn't front running them. Like that's that's a common criticism of payment for order flow that I just don't think is likely, um, just because of the sheer audacity of doing something like that. It just makes it incredibly unlikely for that to be the case. But what what is actually a problem is that the national best bid and offer system doesn't uh, doesn't effectively um, represent the best the best prices available uh, for retail. And um, a lot of that is, you know, there, there's some market structure reasons, there's some technical reasons regarding latency and, and things like that. But the fundamental premise is that the NBBO isn't the best measuring stick for what the best uh, available price is. And so we're, we're taking this model of, you know, sell your order flow and execute it at the best price, but we're bringing it to crypto where we can provably say this is actually the best price on chain anywhere. And we can say the market maker has to fill your order at this price or better. Otherwise, programmatically, uh, it's rejected. Like there's, you know, there's cryptographic proof that the market maker is giving you the best price available. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to use a smart contract and the smart contract would reject their fills. Um, that, that's one of the differences. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there in, in case you have any questions, but the other difference uh, it is just the high resolution aspect of of the market prices on on the flow. Definitely makes sense. I I think maybe even backing up f between like before we jump into more of like the pros and cons of payment for order flow is what what is the main goal that payment for order flow actually accomp accomplishes? One for the people that are kind of buying that order flow. And then secondly, like the people that are selling these order flow to uh, the market makers. Yeah, fundamentally payment for order flow is an efficient market mechanism for uh, executing volume, basically filling orders from retail traders. And the, uh, the reason that it's actually like a good efficient market mechanism is because if you're a retail trader, you shouldn't have to pay fees to trade. Your flow is non-toxic, uh, which means statistically over time, there's there's a lack of correlation with uh, where the market is moving on the order of milliseconds, not on the order of minutes or hours or days or months. Uh, on that time scale, there is very much a correlation with where uh, retail trades go. But on, on the order of milliseconds, no, no retail trader is trying to predict where the market is moving in the next you know, 10 milliseconds, right? And so there, there's a lack of correlation with where um, with where the market is moving and where retail's positions are on the order of 10 milliseconds. And so at that time scale, the flow is considered non-toxic and market makers are willing to pay a premium in order to execute that flow. Um, and toxic you know, order Citadel's flow is just being the trades that are happening in that like 10 millisecond time frame or trying to predict it? So, so toxic order flow, when I say that, I'm referring to basically the risk of adverse selection that market makers face. So market mm -hmm. makers provide a really useful function in society, which is providing liquidity to people who want to buy and sell things. And market makers provide this liquidity, um, you know, potentially at a cost if the people who are buying and selling them, uh, s selling to them are have more information, have more edge about where the market is moving, because at that point, every trade the market maker does, they lose money. And so in, in this scenario, they would stop providing that valuable function to society. And so um, when I say toxic versus non-toxic flow, I basically mean toxic flow is flow where the market makers on average will lose money every trade and non-toxic flow is uh, flow where the market makers will uh, not lose money. It will sort of be random 
whether they make money or whether they lose money uh, on every trade. And this is, again, only at really, really tiny time scale. So milliseconds. Definitely makes sense. I appreciate the clarity there. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then so... G- so that's like a good overview of payment for order flow and why it's beneficial. Um, and then talking a little bit about what, again, like what Dflow is doing, trying to uh, do this in a decentralized fashion, essentially guarantee with the properties of smart contracts that you're getting the best payment or you're getting the best execution. And that is kind of provable on chain. Right. Yep. That's, that's, that's the second half of this is we're, we're trying to make the uh, market mechanism that exists in, in equities markets uh, much more transparent, much more decentralized, and bring it to crypto where anyone can verify these things and uh, also benefit from the good properties of payment for flow. Excellent. So, I mean, one thing that you mentioned earlier was kind of the order flow is the liquidity. Can you talk about like the difference between like institutional market makers, institutional takers and general like retail uh, traders a little bit more in depth? Yeah. So, so that difference is basically what we were just talking about with the fact that um, institutional market makers are, you know, these, these firms that are providing a valuable function to society, which is. Uh, providing liquidity and and being able to allow uh, people who want to trade with them to trade with them whenever um, and across many different venues. Uh, Institutional takers. So, um, you know, I think you should primarily in in the context of payment for order flow, think of prop trading firms that are quantitative and low latency and institutional takers in this sense are the trading firms that generate toxic flow and that market makers would like to avoid trading with if possible. And then the last party that you mentioned is uh, retail traders, which um, market makers would like to be counterparty to. And the reason for that is because retail traders, when they swap tokens, they generally are swapping for like the long-term aspects of it or the utility of the token that they want to receive. Like maybe they want to buy ETH so they can do things on the Ethereum network. Uh, rather than buying ETH so that, you know, they can make make a profit on the order of 15 milliseconds. Like that's that's sort of the difference between the institutional takers and retail traders, retail takers. Gotcha. Very interesting. Now, it's it's all fascinating. And when you kind of peel be- back the curtains, there's there's definitely a lot going on and it's more nuanced than people think. Um, especially in the TradFi world where a lot of it's opaque, even once you do p- peel back the curtains. So maybe before we jump more into like what Dflow is doing, can you talk about wanting or at least initially building this on Solana? Um, I think, why did you not decide to build on like any other chain? Um, Why why choose Solana? Yeah, I think um, Solana was probably in terms of, uh, there are a few reasons here. I think the auctioning model benefits from high transaction throughput. Um, but that's that's not, you know, the fundamental reason we, we chose to build on Solana because the auctioning model is actually something that would work on Ethereum as well. Um, the, the reason we chose to build on Solana initially was primarily just because that was what I was most familiar with. Um, that's kind of, you know, where I first jumped into crypto uh, and, you know, played around with um, like sort of more serious contracts. And mm-hmm. uh, that was one of the reasons. But I, I think since then, we've we've moved on to a um, app chain. And, and the reason for that is because this, this style, like fundamentally what we're doing is MEV re- redistribution and basically extracting the MEV out of, uh, out of the order flow at the application layer and directing 100% of it back to the user. So we're, we're just giving them all of the MEV back from their um, order flow. And in order to have, in order to be able to build this application, you need a lot of control over the validator stack. And so uh, initially on Solana, I think we realized we needed more control over the validator stack than we initially had. And so we, we moved over to um, a uh, app chain. Very cool, interesting. 
Um, I did not know that part. So on the app chain side, um, I, I think today in my mind, there's kind of like two main kind of competitors, one being Avalanche and the other being Cosmos. Could you talk about like which one you chose, how you decided to choose it, and then kind of what is uh, some of the things that you're looking for specifically in the app chain? Yeah, we, we're building on top of the Cosmos SDK. Um, but I, I would sort of emphasize like the main, the main thing we were looking out of whatever infrastructure we chose to use was just, um, how, I guess, you know, how, how good of an engineering job the, uh, open source community had done. And, you know, we certainly intend to contribute back as well. Um, and I think the Cosmos SDK did a really good job, uh, given, given how it's architected, it's, it's got a really elegant architecture, um, and it made it really easy to build our application on top of it, um, as well as modify any layers that we wanted to. It, it, the architecture just made a lot of sense for what we were choosing to do. Um, we didn't we didn't look too closely into um, Avalanche, to be completely honest. I think uh, it, it really just came down to the fact that the Cosmos SDK and the um, community there was just perfect for what we were looking to do. And so we just moved forward with it. It makes sense. Um, on, on the tech side, what, what things particularly are you looking to kind of customize that would have been more difficult on like a general purpose chain? Yeah, I, I would say the primary thing is um, low latency communication between uh, retail traders and market makers. Um, and sort of as an example of this, if we, if if a retail trader wants to get a quote from a market maker, uh, if in that process on chain state has to be updated for every quote the market maker gives, even on the fastest chain you can think of, that's too slow. Um, market makers are quoting and updating their quotes extremely often, um, and it's it's impossible to do that. Uh, it's impossible to require the quotes to uh, settle into a block. Um, in order to get them over to the retail trader. So latency between these two parties is what we were looking for. And in particular, we're, uh, you know, we're going to be releasing some information about um, this mechanism we're calling optimistic coordination, which is sort of a general purpose mechanism that um, two parties can use to communicate with each other uh, in a way where the um, node that's sort of you know, reverse proxying this communication is trustless. And so we, we avoid the doubly trusted relay problem. Uh, we, we have no trust components. Um, and these two parties still get to communicate with, with each other in a low latency way. Gotcha. So just to reiterate, the biggest problem with general purpose chains and what you experienced on Solana was specifically kind of Oracle updates and being able to do market updates uh for the on-chain border books because the latency was too high for both of those things combined right like uh, to, just to illustrate this let's say you open up metamask and you you want to receive a quote from a market maker if that quote needs to settle into uh like the ethereum blockchain or the solana blockchain um before you're even able to see it that you know that number of milliseconds is, is still too high uh, so the finality Ethereum, of the yeah. transactions? The the finality of the transactions and then um, just being able to, uh, I guess, ha have a good user experience when you're, when mm -hmm. you're trading. Like, you know, get quotes quickly, be able to um, interact quickly with the market maker. Like, these interactions are super important for a good UX. Um, and that was one of the things that was really important. The, the other sense. thing that I, I haven't mentioned yet that's also really important for why we chose to build uh, on an app chain is the fact that we can now support um, pretty much any blockchain, any any network, any layer one or layer two, uh, because we abstract the actual settlement layer away. So the Dflow app chain, in order for it to support a new network, swaps on a new network, we essentially need to write a parser for the transaction buffer, which I think, you know, to simplify that statement, it, it's it's maybe a week or two's worth of work. Um, so it's uh, it, it's another big gain that we get. Interesting. Uh, and so you, and you said settlement, so are you doing execution 
on that chain as well? Or are you doing it? Can it be on any other O1? Yeah. So the app chain itself, uh, it's, it's only responsibilities are to host the auctions and to, uh, facilitate communication between the retail trader and the market maker. Mm -hmm. Um, the actual tokens that are being swapped, they are not bridged over to the Dflow chain. And so they remain on what, what I refer to as the settlement network. Um, but it's, you know, just ETH layer one or Polygon or Solana. Um, and the Dflow network is able to interact with these chains, uh, by building transaction buffer parsers. Very interesting. Hmm. Uh, very cool. And one of the things that you talked about specifically was MEV and re, um, kind of giving MEV back to the people. Uh, could you talk about like your thoughts there and what the goal is? Yeah. Um, I think generally how I see MEV redistribution playing out over the next year or two is, uh, right now we're, we're in this phase where, um, users will go and, and try to swap tokens and their swap transaction generates some amount of MEV. Um, and that generated amount can be split up into two categories. There's an atomic MEV, which is just basically, you know, how much can you ARB this, this swap for against current decentralized venue prices? And then there's statistical MEV, which is um, more, more a function of like, uh, it's a more quantitative thing where, um, if this trade happened at this point in time, is it likely for other things to happen at other points in time? And you can then, uh, you know, order transactions in a way that you take advantage of this non-atomic opportunity that's created. Um, and I think right now where we are today is, uh, people focus a lot on atomic MEV and the fact that, you know, you, you can ARB a user and then give them some percentage of it back. I think long term, uh, we're going to end up in a place where um, atomic MEV 100% goes back to the user and statistical MEV is the only thing that's uh, sort of competed on for um, giving uh, rebates back to, back to the user. And so what Dflow is doing is just giving right off the bat, we just give 100% of the atomic MEV back to the user. Uh, which is far more competitive than I think most MEV redistribution systems. Um, and then the statistical MEV is, you know, in, in equities markets, that's just called market maker rebates. Um, that goes over to the user as well. Interesting. And why are you returning a hundred percent of the atomic MEV? I, I think there, there are a few reasons for this. Um, one fundamentally, I believe that, Retail traders should not be getting ARBed and then given some percentage of whatever ARB they generated as sort of payment for that ARB. I think uh, that's that's an inefficient system. And if you look at how the equities markets work, um, that system is is illegal. If that's uh, you know you call that front running, and the SEC doesn't like that. And so uh, not only is it illegal, it's just uh, it's it's way too competitive for market makers uh, to actually compete for that order flow to be pulling that sort of shenanigan. E even if it isn't, if, even if it wasn't illegal in equities markets, it would just never happen because there's too much competition for retail equities flow. The reason it happens in crypto is because there's not really that much competition for uh, retail crypto fl flow. And so um, that's kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, which in the next year or two, we're going to see a lot of competition for retail flow. And, you know, building, building infrastructure around trying to uh, give retail users some amount of, um, you know, some percentage of their atomic R back is in an inefficient system and an inefficient thing to focus on with infrastructure built around order flow auctioning in the first place. You know, it's, it's going to go away. It, it'll be pointless to try and, you know, give a percentage of atomic MEV back to the user. We're, we're saying 100% goes to them off the bat. And the way we're doing that is you have to give them best execution. You have to give them the best available printed price on any centralized or decentralized venue, uh, including price improvements and size improvements. And 100% of that, that translates to 100% of MEV goes to them. And on top of that, you can, uh, you, you, you pay them market condition 
based uh, rebates. And that's the statistical MEV component. One thing you mentioned there was uh, best pricing, whether on-chain or off-chain. With off-chain having higher latencies and kind of slower pricing updates, how are you able to guarantee that? Yeah, so um, what one thing we're doing differently here is uh, we are, we're not going to be bringing, um, you know, prices and price, prices on chain. Uh, the, the way that we're planning on, on measuring what is best execution is um, allowing uh, users of, of the Dflow infrastructure. So in this case, think, you know, if someone builds a wallet and they want to make sure their, their users are getting the best prices, that, that operator of the wallet can basically provide a custom function to the Dflow network that the Dflow network can ping and say um, and, and and receive a best price from, and um, that that's sort of that's an off-chain component, but it's uh, interfaced with in a decentralized way, um, and in that way we we are sort of making it so that whoever is supplying this function this. Uh, I guess off-chain function can aggregate liquidity from any source that's both decentralized or centralized, and the Dflow network in some of the optimistic coordination stuff we're doing um, will be able to uh, basically read values off Binance's best bid and offer um, fill orders. Interesting. And is this going back to kind of the app chain? This is uniquely enabled by the app chain. I think um, th this is uniquely enabled by being able to control the, the validator stack. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think we would have been able to build this sort of mechanism on um, an existing layer one, and, and we just sort of had to uh, move over to an app chain. Very interesting. So is it kind of your prediction that majority of DeFi moves over to these app chains where they have kind of higher control over validators over the long term? I'm curious. Um, I, I think I think we will see some types of applications move over to the app chain. I think the, um, you know, we'll see a lot of applications try the app chain and some of them will stick and some of them won't. I think a good criteria for whether an application should use an app chain is whether they are technically capable of building their application on a layer one. If they're technically capable, if it's possible to do that, then they should do that for the you know, security benefits, the decentralization benefits. Um, but if fundamentally their application doesn't work without being able to control the validator stack, then they should not move over to an app chain. And MEV extraction, in my opinion, is not a great reason to move over to an, to an app chain. Um, I think it really just comes down to fundamentally, does this technology work on a layer one? If not, build it on an app chain. That makes sense. Very interesting. Um, yeah, lots of different things to uh, kind of consider when building this. Uh, a lot more than I think people would realize uh, when they go out and want to say like, I want to build a dApp. Uh, there's a lot more nuance going behind uh, kind of all the decisions going into it. For sure, yeah, and this was this was definitely uh, kind of a learning process for us too. We started building this in the summer of 2021, um, and we've just learned a lot about you know not only order flow but what what market makers want from an application like this, what uh, you know wallets want from an application like this, um, all of the small little pitfalls that that could break this, like super nuanced things that you kind of only get to by crossing the bridge once you get there. Um, and I, I think we, we've learned a ton and are super excited to get this out into the world. Yeah, could you share a little bit more? I mean, I'm sure you've talked with quite a few market makers now at this point, kind of trying to understand what they want. Could you kind of articulate that to the rest of us on like what they're really looking for when they're doing decentralized market making? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in, in the specific case of, like, order flow auctioning infrastructure, they care a lot about the non-toxicity of flow um, and the fact that, you know, if they're, if they're buying, uh, let's just say, wallet A's order flow, then 
they should have strong guarantees that the order flow is actually coming from wallet A. Um, and, you know, they're, they're sort of like, consequentially, if, you're, if you have that information, you have two options for how you would build an order flow auctioning infrastructure. One of them is um, what we actually did in, in our first iteration of Dflow, which is we would, uh, we would combine all of the order flow from many different wallet sources, and we would combine it into a bucket, which is, you know, based on the token type, like the token pair. So mm -hmm. we would take, you know, all, all of the wallets, ETH, USDC flow, put it into a single auction, and we would let the market makers bid into this auction. And, and that's, that's actually non-optimal because um, you kind of muddle the various levels of toxicity of all of the different sources. And that hurts, that, that hurts the revenue that the non-toxic order flow sources see, and that helps the revenue of the toxic order flow sources. But in both cases, this is just bad for market makers because market makers are able to reason, you know, less strictly about what they're purchasing. Um, another thing that we've, we've learned that market makers really like is they, they want to be able to reason about what they're purchasing in, um, in, in trading terms. So it's, it's easier for a market maker to basically say, Hey, I want to buy, a billion dollars worth of ETH USDC flow rather than try to compete in an order by order auction for, you know, every single order, they can sort of say, okay, I'm going to buy this flow. I know I'm getting $1 billion worth of notional size delivered to me from this wallet. Um, and that's, that's a really strong guarantee to give market makers. So it's just small learnings like that really helped yeah. in building this product to, to be attractive for market makers. Definitely lots of, lots of nuance. Um, and again, I, I want to kind of bring it back to the user and why the user ultimately benefits from this. So could you maybe just re-articulate kind of your vision for Dflow and some of the things that Dflow uniquely helps from the user aspect when their order flow gets routed to kind of these different market makers? Yeah, um, for sure. So uh, I, I won't name any wallets, but you know you can you can probably get there are actually many wallets with this fee structure of you know uh, they'll charge something like fifty five basis points, fifty basis points in in their own fees, and then the AMM that they route to will charge something like thirty basis points, and so in aggregate the user ends up paying something like seventy, eighty, ninety basis points on every trade they do, um, every every swap they do. And of this, you know, 70, 80, 90 basis points, the wallet only sees something like 50 basis points, 30 basis points goes to the AMM. Um, in, in a Dflow system, let's say if a wallet integrated with Dflow, the user pays zero basis points to the Dflow infrastructure. So that's minus 30 to the AMM already. So now the user is only paying, let's say, 50 basis points. That's what the wallet is charging them. Uh, and zero basis points to Dflow. So now uh, user pays less and wallet makes a higher percentage of the fees that the user is paying. And in fact, the wallet makes 100% of the fees that the user is paying. Um, and then on top of that, the wallet and the user get rebates from the market maker, uh, which could sort of be anywhere from one to 10 basis points, possibly more, possibly less. Interesting. So from... Uh, just to reiterate, from the user standpoint, they get lower kind of swaps or trades uh, on their end. And then from kind of the wallet infrastructure side, kind of a partner, um, if you will, they get uh, to keep a higher percentage of the overall um, kind of revenue collect collected from people swapping on these trades. Uh, so it, it helps both parties. That's exactly right. And, and in addition to that, there's also the question of execution quality. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're trading on an AMM, it's sort of questionable, you know, what execution quality you're getting. You're probably being front run at some points in time. Um, so, uh, yeah, with, with, with Dflow infrastructure, it's sort of guaranteed that you're not only getting best execution quality, you're paying zero basis point fees. And all of this is thanks to the fact that your flow is non-toxic and the Dflow infrastructure lets your flow trade 
at a market price, uh, which is, it's, it's all just, all, all of this uh, fee savings and high execution quality is enabled by the fact that we let the order flow trade at, at market prices. And it's, it's a market structure innovation, uh, fundamentally, what Dflow is. Interesting. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, lo lots of nuance um, and kind of parsing apart, but I think that's kind of the interesting part of the long form conversations is to have some of these more like intricate uh, details. One of the other things that you mentioned was kind of the composability aspect and how you can compose within uh, Dflow. Could you share a little bit more about that and kind of, I guess, what you would like to see on that front? Yeah, um, I, I think what, when I think of composability with Dflow, there are uh, there are a few directions that we can go with this. I think um, one is we can basically support the order flow sale from any type of application, and this this includes decentralized protocols. So decentralized protocols can sell their order flow through Dflow, and um, this is true despite the fact that Dflow is an app chain. Um, so that, that's one example of composability. Go ahead. No, I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this app chain thing. So even say like, for example, we use Ethereum and Solana, um, kind of the more popular communities today. How are they able to mm -hmm. kind of do that composability within uh, Dflow if Dflow is its own app chain on Cosmos? Right. It's, it's because fundamentally it's because the tokens are never bridged over to the Dflow network. Um, and the Dflow network, I, I, I guess just to walk through the life cycle of a trade on Solana, for example, um, if, if you want to, if you want to trade to, uh, SPL tokens, uh, for each other, um, how, how this works with Dflow is you basically go to any, any node on the Dflow network. And you, uh, I mean, when I say you, I, I mean your your client code, so the wallet's code, would basically mm -hmm. ping the Dflow network and ask for uh, a quote from the market maker that has um, already won this auction. So I guess that's another important detail is the auctions are pre-computation, they're for future order flow. Um, so the, the wallet will ask the Dflow network for um a, uh, a quote and a transaction buffer. And that transaction buffer is fundamentally just two SPL to 20 token transfers. And so this, uh, this transaction buffer goes back to retail, retail signs it uh, if, they, if they like the price, send it back to the Dflow network, Dflow network sends it to the market maker, market maker signs the transaction and sends it to the Solana network. So in, in, this, in this model, the, um, the transaction, the, the tokens are never leaving the um, the, the settlement network, the settlement network. So Solana, mm -hmm. and um, with some of the optimistic coordination things we're doing, uh, we're adding sort of economic incentives against um, dishonesty. Okay, interesting. So if you were, and then the liquidity itself, if the if it's not actually leaving Solana in this example, are you are you fundamentally just trading on the Solana network? I'm confused. Like, I guess like I I'm having a little bit of a difficult time wrapping my head around like where the app chain comes in. Yeah the the app chain's purpose uh, is is just to host the auctions and then just to facilitate communication between the retail trader and the market maker. So the order book, um, and so with the, with the in a sense, is on the the app chain, right? And and rather than an order book, it's it's just a sort of a, a like a straightforward auction, a you know a blind auction where first price uh, wins wins the order flow contract, so wins the right mm -hmm. to receive the order flow. Um, but yeah, I guess that that's the purpose of the of the uh, D flow chain is just so that the auctions happen in a decentralized way. Um, and the auctions are uh, basically determine which of the market makers that participate on the Dflow network receive the right to execute the flow. And then, so that that's, you know, pretty straightforward state tracking, but that's, that's the state that's on the Dflow network. 
Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. And then, so yep. you're kind of doing all this kind of in the background again, to kind of give best execution to, uh, the trader, but then also, um, provide additional benefits to kind of the third party infrastructure by allowing them to keep more of the fees instead of splitting that, uh, with, um, a market maker that would give them worse execution. Right. Right. So I instead of, instead of, you know, having some of that MEV go to searchers and whatnot, um, a hundred percent of the atomic MEV goes back to the user. And so in this case, the user is either the wallet or the actual end user who's trading, uh, Dflow is unopinionated. So, you know, the, the wallet can choose to re redistribute its, its earnings, however they choose, uh, between themselves and their users. Um, but yeah, that's right. The, uh, the wallet is, is getting some of the MEV back and, um, can choose to distribute that with their users, how they, how they please. Very interesting. Maybe uh, kind of jumping forward a little bit, where do you kind of, or what do you envision? I think more broadly DeFi and crypto markets ends up looking like, because I think today we're kind of far cry from what the TradFi markets are. So how, how do you envision it? Do you envision, um, yeah, I would, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that um, DeFi and crypto is, you know, sort of has has this issue of there's not really that much liquidity available uh, in, in many DeFi ecosystems. Um, w one of the reasons for that is is just the fact that market makers aren't able to provide liquidity in in a way that guarantees they they won't just get, you know, ran over by toxic takers. Right. Like, um, you know, I, I think this is fundamentally a problem when it comes to like on chain order books or AMMs, where um, if someone wants to provide liquidity, they have no good mechanism to revise their quotes uh, in a way that guarantees that, you know, someone who has like a handshake deal with a validator uh, or someone who just pays some block space auctioning infrastructure a little bit more won't be able to run over the market maker when the market moves. Um, and, and so that's, that's the fundamental problem, in my opinion, of, of what's holding uh, crypto DeFi back. I mean, certainly there are questions of regulation and all of that, but uh, assuming all things equal there, um, this, is, this is one of the more major issues with uh, why DeFi hasn't really taken off in the way that um, we've seen in, I mean, in, in the way that equities markets have. Uh, uh, and I, I think that the Dflow type infrastructure is one of the solves, one of one of the uh, key market infrastructures for bringing sophisticated market makers from a wide variety of places into crypto and able to provide liquidity on chain. Because we make it fair for the market makers, we uh, and I guess by making it fair, we bring a lot more institutional capital into crypto, um, and that that just helps everyone. That you know, makes markets efficient, liquidity available, so on and so forth. So really boiling it down to toxic versus non-toxic flow and being able to better understand uh, where those are coming from. And if you can kind of, and what this is, what Dflow is ultimately trying to enable, uh, that will allow better liquidity for market or make market mar makers more comfortable ultimately than allowing more liquidity for everybody. Right. And I, I, I would just add the, the fundamental new thing that we are doing is we are allowing the order flow to trade at its own market price um, based on how toxic it is. So market makers will pay more for flow they realize is non-toxic and they will pay less for flow that they realize is toxic. Our infrastructure, its only purpose is to create these markets, enable the flow to trade at a market price, and the rest sort of takes care of itself. Very interesting. No, I, I'm I'm fascinated by it all. Uh, I I would love, I mean, for majority of kind of 
TradFi to ultimately end up on uh, crypto rails. Do you think that in the end game uh, that will happen or they will kind of be two separate systems that will always kind of coexist? Um, no, I, I, I definitely think that a lot of TradFi will end up on crypto rails. I think that's, uh, that's one of the promises of this technology is that it's actually, it, it, it is genuinely better financial rails than what has existed in the past. And mm -hmm. I think market forces are going to force, you know, infrastructure to move over to where things are most efficient. And that's, that's going to be crypto. It'll, it'll take a while. I think we'll see a lot of, you know, um, dog token type things, uh, which I love. I'm not, I'm not a critic, but, um, <laughs> Until until we start seeing more institutional capital, I think we're going to see a little bit more um, limited uh, adoption for day to day uses and you know bigger infrastructural thing is, things. True, I guess kind of jumping off of that with like recent events and how 2022 played out with the FTX implosion, with some of these large lenders kind of going under. What is your thought or kind of um, conversations that you've been having with market makers or these institutional players? Do you feel like they're still open to these conversations or now they're kind of like wait and see? Um, I'm curious just to get your thoughts on like how you think 2023 will play out. Yeah, I think um, these, these events are great catalysts for DeFi because pe people are they're worrying a lot more about counterparty risk than they did in 2019, 2020. Um, and, you know, if, if you have it, at these large sort of institutional firms, if you have a committee that's dedicated to counterparty risk, and then you show them what DeFi is, um, their counterparty is in open source smart contract. And yeah. that's, you know, to, to a risk committee that is actually intellectually litigating the, uh, the quality of their counterparty that's like as high quality as it gets like that's that's who you want your counterparty to be right like a co immutable code right it doesn't get better than that so the conversations we've been having are um are, are pretty positive i think a lot of people are, are bullish on on DeFi, especially some of the uh quant trading firms that you know you you hear about um that haven't really forayed too much into crypto but you know have been dabbling for years yeah, I'm I'm definitely excited for 2023. I, I stuck around. Um, I was class of 2017 and ultimately uh, stayed around after 2018 and kind of when everything blew up and uh, in the world of like Ethereum and all the ICOs that happened. At that point in yeah. time, it was primarily just ICOs and there wasn't even really usable products. I think at the very end, we got DAI which was like kind of the first like, or one of like the first like unsketchy yeah. stable coins. And that was like really like the first product, but there weren't actually really any applications per se. And so what makes me so much more excited now is that there are actual products. There's builders like yourself uh, trying to figure out a lot of these like really hard engineering problems from going from the TradFi world to making a better system and the web three world. And that does take some time, but the fact that there are people that are working on this, we already have kind of at least usable products. Um, we are kind of seeing these high throughput chains. We're seeing kind of these custom chains, the, the building blocks and pieces are there. And so when they get refined slightly more, I'm excited to see all these users kind of flow in and actually use web three and crypto more broadly. Cause Right now, it's it's not very many people, but I, I know it's going to be around. Where in 2018, it was a little bit more, uh, a little bit more worrisome when everybody left. Yep, hundred percent. I think I think in in December of this year, we're going to look back and see that a ton of new market structure has come out, and that's really going to you know lead the path for uh, the next next bull, whatever it may be. I, I think just institutional, true institutional adoption and into uh, everyone's day-to-day -day lives is, is what we're going to see after this year. I hope so. I'm, I'm rooting for it. And 
Um, I, I definitely agree. The best counterparty in a sense is just having that immutable code on that front. When you talk to people, I would say like the only kind of pushback that I see or I hear is kind of the smart contract risk and like the code being hacked for whatever reason. Do you have like any good answers of like, yes, the smart contract is kind of like the best counterparty because you know the rules aren't going to change, um, but it is software and software sometimes has issues and bugs. Uh, how do you kind of, in your conversations, um, does that come up at all? Yeah, I think, um, I think this is actually just like the most fundamental question in crypto because for people to believe in a system like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they need to believe in the cryptographic principles that sort of guarantee these systems can't, you know, you can't do things like double spend with them. Um, and to, uh, you know, trusting a single smart contract on top of these systems is just that belief, but on a smaller scale. Like you, you need to first believe that Ethereum is secure. And then, you know, once you believe the Ethereum protocol is secure, you'll start trusting, you know, contracts that, that build on top of that. But really it, it just takes time. And the longer, you know, contracts have stuck around and the more, and the more experience people get at writing them and analyzing them, the more trust we will build for these systems. So this is, for me, it's just a question of time uh, till, till people start, you know, truly understanding what is good and what is not. I love it. I, I do agree. Maybe, so wrapping it up, um, 2023, is there anything like particularly ecosystem, either project or thing that you're really looking forward to um, for this year as kind of we re-enter kind of the builder's market? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to all of the like block space auctioning infrastructure uh, becoming really, really widely adopted. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think that's one of the things that brings institutional liquidity from market makers on chain because um, that sort of levels the playing field a little bit more than it is today. Um, so that, that's and one of the things. Could you give a good example of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, on Solana, Jito, for example, is, is a project that I really love. Um, and they're building, you know, block space auctioning infrastructure for the Solana blockchain. Uh, I, I think if every validator used Gito's infrastructure, that would make it a lot easier for, um, you know, institutional market makers to come and provide liquidity because now they can revise their quotes in a fair auction, uh, a fair block space auction, rather than, you know, um, not having that. That makes sense. Sorry, I cut you off. Any other predictions? No, um, I, I think other than that, I'm just I'm I'm excited for it to be, you know, kind of quiet right now, and uh, for people just to be head down and and working, <laughs> you know, building stuff that's actually useful. And so I, I think it's we're going to see the fruits of that labor this year. So pretty stoked for that. I agree. No, it's. Uh... It's an exciting time. I think the people that are kind of around now, just as they were in 2018, 2019, are the ones that ultimately um, really gain the benefits and see kind of the fruits of their labor uh, one, in a couple of years time. And so everybody today that's pushing the eco forward on building, uh, making blockchains easier to use, making liquidity easier to bring on chain, uh, these are going to be the people and they are the people that are pushing the industry forward. And I'm very excited for uh, when the next kind of bull market or expansion period comes, uh, all these services will be extremely widely used and uh, it'll be cool to just see people interacting with um, all these things on chain. Yep. hundred percent. Could not be more. Perfect. Excited. Perfect. Well, yeah, I really appreciate your time again. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for uh, going into all the intricacies, um, all the difference and nuances of order flow um, and the positive benefits that they bring to the industry. And um, yeah, thank you for helping pushing the industry forward. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thanks for having me on.